Welcome everyone to, I am like super excited because I've been talking about this particular tasting for quite a while. I am so excited to be partnering with um, these amazing wines and this amazing guy, Chris, hello. <laughs> Howdy, so good to see you all. Thank you for having me, excited to be. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, everyone has wine and we're super excited to taste. And then Catherine, why don't you say hello as well? Hi, um, I am Storka's head of marketing. So I've enlisted Chris to represent our company and go through a tasting of a bunch of our wines. And he's extremely knowledgeable and can really walk through the region and the flavors and give you a lot of uh, really interesting information that'll be really exciting to hear. And um, we're ready to, to go. We awesome. also, I, I, if he doesn't care, I Zach, our founder, is also on the Zoom. Oh, amazing! <laughs> uh, so I think we're all really excited to to kind of relish in the conversation. Perfect. And Zach, if you feel like uh, unmuting yourself, um, please uh, feel free. So um, Chris has taught me something, a, a lot of things. So you should check out this really great Instagram live that we did uh, last week. And one of the things that I learned is that um, his last name, I'm pronouncing it, let me know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Palodian? Uh, very close, Paul Doyen. There's uh, no O after the, L, uh, after the L. The L and the D next to one another, those two consonants, very like, people love putting an O in there. Uh, you're not the first and you won't be the last, but it's Paul Doyen. Paul Doyen like Kardashian. Exactly, very similar, <laughs> very similar. And that's one of the things that I learned. So um, seriously, I'm, I, I've been drinking, especially this particular wine for a couple of years. I tell the story about how I was introduced to it. Um, then I passed it on to, um, to Pam and we've been like sipping on it for a few years now. So why don't we get into um, the bottles? I always have a million questions. You guys know I always invite you to um, stop and ask us any questions. And uh, Chris, I'm gonna let you take it over. And then um, I have a question about each one of the wines that we're gonna taste tonight. Absolutely, cool, awesome. Well, thank you all again for being here on a Friday night. Um, not sure what plans y'all have for the rest of the weekend, but I really appreciate y'all starting your weekend with us uh, as we taste through wines from Armenia. Just a show of hands real quick, who's had a wine from Armenia before tonight? Regine, you can raise your hand. I know okay. you're typing them up, but anyone else out there? Ron, did you raise your hand? I wasn't sure. No? Okay, cool. So this is really exciting then. We've got a lot of uh, first timers out here trying Armenian wine. And you know, before I was the brand ambassador for Storica, I ran a wine bar in Houston, Texas. Before that, I ran the wine programs for Houston's restaurant, which maybe some of you know, I think they have a bandera, bandera on Michigan Avenue but I did a, a kind of regional wine development for them. And for me, what I always loved about working in the wine industry was discovering new regions and finding something different. Cause we've all had Sancerre before. We've all had wine from Bordeaux and Burgundy and Tuscany. For me, what's so, so exciting about Armenia is it's such a historical wine region, um, but that it's also so new and something that people don't know a whole lot about. So I'm excited to kind of share the story of the Armenian wine Renaissance with y'all tonight. Um, so may I stop you for a yeah. quick second? I, yeah. I know I don't have to say this, but hopefully you all have already popped the kush and are already starting drinking. Okay. I knew I didn't have to say anything, but I wanted to make sure. All right. Sounds good. And you have the black label, which I believe is the Blanc de Blanc, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of funny. The, the one with a black label is a, is labeled Blanc de Blanc and the one with a white label, it's actually the same varieties. Mm -hmm. um, just a slightly different cepage, like a, a little more um, Vosquiat on the uh, non-vintage bottling. So um, slightly different, but uh, not by much. It's really the defining difference between the two is kind of like the lees aging, um, kind of the elevage on it. But um, both are fantastic wines. Um, and yeah, excited to kind of talk to them, uh, talk with you all about those tonight. And if it's all right, I'd love to do just a quick primer. So as you drink the Kush sparkling wine, as you're all sipping on that, we can kind of talk about kind of the history of Armenia, 
kind of the background of the region, the terroir. So what I'm going to do, if it's all right, is I'm going to share my screen real quick. I'm going to come in here real quick and let's see if I can get this all set up. There we go. I think we're good to go. All right. We're going to share this presentation. If I could just get a thumbs up that y'all can see what I'm seeing. Great. I love it. Cool. So we're going to quickly run through about 6,000 years of winemaking history um, mm -hmm. before we jump into kind of the details of this particular wine that we have. We'll try and get through those 6,000 years in about five to 10 minutes. Uh, so we're going to move at a quick pace, but you guys can keep up. I, I know you can. So. Um, so where is Armenia is kind of a good starting off point. Um, I think I had mentioned this in the Instagram live that we did last week, but as a kid, as an Armenian, you know, we didn't have the Kardashians, we didn't have the Kardashians like 15, 20 years ago. So when people would ask like, what's Armenia? We've never heard of this place. They'd be like, oh, it's right next to Azerbaijan, don't you know? Um, and that joke did not always go over well in like kindergarten and first grade. Uh, the best reference people had was kind of the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding. That was kind of the closest comparison. But um, the region that we're in right now is the kind of the Caucasus, right? So to the north, you have the country of Georgia. You can see it here in this image with this big mountain range kind of cutting through. Above that, you have Russia. Beneath Armenia, you have Azerbaijan, Iran, and then to the west, you have Turkey. So this star here where it says Yerevan, that's the capital of Armenia. And then right over here, just to the east, that's the large lake in Armenia, Lake Savan. So if we're thinking in terms of size, Armenia is about the size of Maryland, and the country itself only has about 3 million inhabitants. So not a whole lot of people. But if you double or even triple that number, that's how many people are part of the Armenian diaspora. And about 1 million of that uh, 5 to 8 million people live in North America. So about a third as many people who live in Armenia are part of the Armenian diaspora here in the US. It's a very broad, very strong, tight knit community. You know, I don't know if anyone in the chats met an Armenian before. Um, you can raise your hand if you have, but chances are if you have met an Armenian, they're very proud of the fact that they are Armenian. It, it, it's kind of a spread out place um, in terms of the diaspora, but a really exciting thing. And, you know, about half of all registered wineries in the country are less than a decade old, which gives you a sense of just how new this area is for winemaking, modern winemaking, we should say. And then people always ask, is it part of the EU? And it's not. It's part of this like quasi partnership. Um, and it's part of the Eurasian Union. So it doesn't have the same kind of like legal requirements with appellations or PDOs or anything like that compared to uh, Spain, Italy and France. So what's kind of like the terroir of Armenia? Like we saw that image with kind of mountain ranges and mountains are certainly one of the biggest parts of Armenia. But the other big thing that I think plays a role here are these river valleys that feed out of Lake Savan and they provide a moderating temperature. The temperature can swing as much as 50 degrees from day to night, which is an insane diurnal shift when you think about it. I mean, places like Ribera del Duero or Baja, Mexico or the Rhone Valley of France, those places have similar degree shifts, um, but maybe not quite as extreme as this one. Um, and the soil here is predominantly limestone, some volcanic deposits, which in terms of winemaking, that can create some really fantastic complex flavors that I think you're all probably picking up on right now in that kush. Um, and there's this quote from a famous wine writer, her name is Jancis Robinson, and she says, what Armenia lacks in latitude, it makes up for an altitude. So this tiny little country has so, so much character because of its high, high elevation. The lowest elevation vines in this country are over a thousand meters, which are the highest elevation vines in Spain, for instance. High elevation in Spain is maybe 750 to a thousand meters. This is much, much higher than that. So pretty cool stuff. Um, so and if we wanna go Chris, all the way back, yeah, yeah. May I ask you this? And again, we have a mix. So we have a couple of Psalms on, and then we have people who are new to uh to wine can you tell us again what does the, what does the ele high elevation mean and how does it translate in the glass for the consumer 
Absolutely. Great question. Um, so high elevation is something we like in wine because as you go up in elevation, the UV light gets much, much stronger. I know that from every time I get sunburned whenever I go to like Colorado or West Texas, but that UV light, what it does is it allows the grapes to develop more character. They get more ripe, but because of that like temperature swing that we talked about, they're able to retain their acidity. So it's kind of like you get the benefit of a warmer, sunnier climate but then you don't have the downside of like lower acidity. You still have this tension in the wine, if that kind of makes sense. So high elevation, like in parts of France or like Alsace, you know, that's an area where you get these grapes with amazing concentration because they're grown at such a high elevation in such a sunny area. The same in Italy and Spain, people always love that high elevation because it can add such concentration to the berries themselves. Any other questions about terroir? Thank you so much for asking that. Sometimes I can blaze over very important information. So thank you for catching that. No, Anything else that we should be talking about there? Not for me. How about you guys? And please unmute yourself and ask a question if you have a question. And I know Catherine's keeping an eye on the chat. Well, if not, we'll just uh, jump in. We'll go all the way back. I didn't pay very good attention in Sunday school, but if you go to the Old Testament, if you go to uh, the book of Genesis, they talk about how Noah's Ark landed on this mountain called Mount Ararat, which belonged to Armenia. It was uh, kind of in the foothills of this mountain when the flood water subsided that Noah planted vines. So according to the Bible anyways, the first vines planted were in Armenia. And if you go to the Smithsonian or the National Geographic, some of the first evidence of winemaking was found in Armenia in this little tiny cave in the southern part of the country. This cave probably dates back about 6,000 years, if not more, to about 4100 BCE, which is pretty wild to think about. It's not often that science and religion agree on anything, but they kind of agree that winemaking began in this part of the world, whether it was in Armenia or one of the nearby countries, generally in this neck of the woods. So really exciting stuff. So that's kind of the origins of Armenian winemaking. And you can see here a map of Armenia's original kingdom. Armenia was the first country to adopt Christianity um, in 301 AD. And you can see that back then, Armenia extended all the way from the Mediterranean to the Caspian Sea. Very different than that image we saw earlier of a small landlocked country right? It used to be much, much larger as, and just over time, as a result of geopolitical conflicts, you know, the Armenian genocide, the Ottoman Empire, as a result of all of that, we ended up with a much smaller country, the country that we all kind of know today. And it was in 1921 that Armenia got absorbed into the Soviet Union. And when that happened, the Soviets basically looked at every country, they had all of their satellite states, and they were like, well, you're gonna do this for us and you're gonna do this for us. They were good at delegating certain things to certain people. And what they had said was, you know, Armenia, we know that you've been making wine for a long time, but we need brandy. And we've already decided that Hungary, Georgia, some of these other places, they're gonna make wine, you're gonna make brandy. So all of the kind of like traditions and history and kind of culture surrounding wine within the country went away because all the juice that was used for wine ended up just getting used for brandy instead. So there's a movement away from wine production, but it, after the Soviet Union fell, there's suddenly this amazing kind of wine renaissance that goes on. You know, for 70 years, these vines weren't being used for wine. They were being used just to make juice that could be distilled into brandy, you know? And uh, these are just some of the headlines and some of the articles that have been written just in the past like five to 10 years about all of the exciting things going on in Armenia. That huge diaspora that we talked about earlier, we're seeing an influx of people that, you know, are homesick for their motherland, you know, and there's the same sort of thing that exists, Armenian birthright that some countries have, where people are going home and exploring these lands and rediscovering these old vineyards that are there. So it's a really exciting thing that's going on within Armenia. Um, I think now would be a good time for us to maybe talk about the sparkling wine that we have. You guys ready? Enough of a history lesson, ready to jump into uh, tasting some wine? That was a great lesson and yes, All I already right, started, cool. but let's do it. Let's do it, cool. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen real quick and let's talk about the sparkling wine that we have. I like Ron's comment, Noah was a drunk. He, he had priorities, he knew what was important to him. But um, cool, so 
Regine, I think you already showed the bottle to everyone. And I know some of you have the Blanc de Blanc, some of you have the uh, Origins, which is the non-vintage. So this is a sparkling wine made in the traditional style or the champagne style, right? Um, which if we compare that to other styles of sparkling wine like Prosecco, this takes much more time. It's a more labor intensive process because it has to go through a secondar secondary fermentation in bottle rather than in a large tank like they use for Prosecco. And as a result of that, there's more contact with like the yeast cells, which gives it that really nice toasty kind of like umami character. Um, but I've done all the talking so far. I'd love some of you that have the wine to maybe unmute yourselves and let us know what you think of it. So um, Pam, I know that you, you're sipping on the wine, right? Snacking on some food too. Maybe maybe we can get your thoughts. Oh my gosh. So this is absolutely delicious. I love it. I love I it. I find this repeatedly. It is so good. And there is definitely a difference between this and the um, the white label, which um, I can't remember how you the labeling how you described it, but this is definitely a lot more complex and five stars. Yeah, thank you so much. I wish I could take all the credit. I didn't make the wine, I just, <laughs> I just talk about it. That, that all goes to Vahe Kushgarian. So Vahe is this really amazing winemaker who was born in Syria. His family went from Syria to Lebanon, war broke out in Lebanon. So he went to Italy and it was while he was living in Italy as a teenager that he discovered wine and really fell in love with it. Um, and then eventually returned to Armenia. You know, when I was speaking to him, he said, I was homesick for a place I had never been to before, um, which is a wild thing. You know, he had grown up in all these other places, but the place he wanted to go to, go back to in a way was Armenia. But he makes the wine in that champagne method and it gives it that really savory character. So in terms of vintages, the, the black label is a 2013. So when you think about that, it spent a lot of time on Lee's developing. Um, it's a minimum of 36 months, but in the case of the particular bottling that's available in the States right now, it's much, much more than that. Um, so really fun stuff. Yeah. Catherine, um, I know we have multiple Catherines on this call, but uh, Catherine, who's sipping right now, um, I'm gonna unmute you and get your thoughts. What are you, what are you thinking about over there? I'm, uh, I'm actually <laughs> drinking the other, so we, tonight, right, aren't staying at home. So we had to bring our wine with us. So we only brought two out of the three bottles with us because, you know, having to to drink all three seemed to be a bit aggressive. So ambitious, actually, some might say, aggressive others might say, but I say ambitious. Ambitious, yes. We do That's have plans great. after this, which, you know, would make it more difficult. But so we're drinking the, is it Basque? Hot. Yeah, so it's Voskeat. Voskeat. So that's what, so we do have the sparkling at home. Um, I'm excited to try that when we get back home. But yeah, we brought the Voskeat and the Zulao Reserve with us. So we're drink, do, drinking the Voskeat first. And there are no wine glasses in this apartment. <laughs> so we're trying to make do with this, um, but it tastes delicious. delicious. Amazing. And like the price point is amazing too. We were just like double checking on what that was after, you know, trying the wine. And I mean, just very approachable. Yeah, Regine, I know you had mentioned in one of our pre-meetings that these wines were available at Binnie's, right? Or at least that the Kush is, right? Do you remember how much it costs over there? Uh, it's under $20. I want to say it's like $19.99. Um, but yes, yes. Which is like the hardest category to find, right? Like sparkling wine, like at or below $20 is super hard, especially if you don't want to drink a Prosecco. And I love Prosecco, but sometimes you want something with the savory character of something made in the champagne style. And at that price point, it's really hard to find. I mean, does anyone have any other like champagne method wines that they really like at a lower price point? Regine, is there one you really enjoy? I, the closest would be maybe um, a Cremant from Alsace. You mm -hmm. know, that um, there are a few that are $20, maybe up to 25. But I mean, what's distinct about Kush to me is not just the flavor profile, but the texture. There's a weightiness. Oh, Kristen is agreeing with me. Kristen is like so expressive. And then she's like, nah, and then she's expressive. Mm -hmm. So tell me, what, why did you light up when I said that, Kristen? Well, it's true. You know, I was trying to think about why this stands apart from other wines. And it's like, it is the first sparkling that I've ever been like, 
ooh, the minerality is amazing, you know? And it's like, I don't usually think about the minerality in terms of taste, but like, it's so good. And it really makes it kind of unique. And then yes, the texture and the kind of weightiness, it, it really makes it just delicious. Yeah. I really love this. So that weightiness kind of plays into that idea we were talking about where high elevation can give you more concentration. Mm -hmm. So these berries are picked in the month of October, which is really, really late for sparkling wine. Um, and as a result of that, you have grapes that have a lot of concentration. So I think with this sparkling wine, you get more than just like bubbles and acid and maybe like citrus. Like you get that depth of flavor that you're talking about with oodles and oodles of acidity behind it as well. So, and anyone else have any big thoughts on, um, on this sparkling wine? I think, um, oh, oh no, Jean, please. No, I was just gonna say, I love it, so. Um, oh, what, you? Miss Red Wine, I'm just teasing. <laughs> Uh, so she is correct. I am a red wine lover. Um, I also love a really good sparkling and a champagne. And I have to call out my dear friend, Pamela Johnson, because her birthday event um, a couple of years ago in Champagne region of France really, I mean, it, it almost made me a champagne snob um, because we had such really good champagne on her trip. Um, and it just increased my knowledge um, of how champagne is made and how I like low sugar um, champagnes, but also how I like Blanc de Blanc. So now whenever I have an opportunity, I go Blanc de Blanc. So this black label Blanc de Blanc is, it's special. So I love it. Awesome. here, here, I will buy it again. I will order it from your website, but if you guys want to ship it to Chicago and find someone where you can ship it to Chicago, let us know so that we can get it locally. I love it. I think I, I will check. Uh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I will check Benny's. Uh, Pam asked me if they have the Blanc de Blanc. I, I'm honestly not sure. I've only purchased the Kush. There is another um, engraved company in Evanston. I believe we've ordered from them before, but I'll send you all uh, his link. He's the one who introduced me to uh, Kush, and this is how I learned about it. So he may have it, and he does deliver to uh, the south side of Chicago. So that's great. Chris, I want to um, thank you for, first of all, your marvelous encapsulation of 6,000 years of history in like less than five minutes, maybe. There's a Spark um, Notes version. It, yeah, it it'll send you down some wormholes though if you you know so thank you for that um we don't i don't have a comment about the sparkling because we weren't able to get that we have um we have the vulcan the voskiat is that right kiat or kiat i i say voskiat but i yeah. think it's probably yeah. like a tomato potato situation you know okay. so, you know i mean that's and it's, it's, del it's delicious there are things about that that remind me even like the savoriness of a good sake but, but, but what I wanted to ask you, though, is about cuisine and not just what to pair this with, but like any thoughts you have as you keep going about what Armenian cuisine is like and how this wine amplifies it. Um, like I know I've never had Armenian food. I know it's not Ottoman food. I know it's not Russian food, but I, I'd love to hear a little bit as you go along, like what that kind of tastes like and what you, what these things, how they synergize together. Absolutely. You know, for me, and we can all kind of talk about what we would pair these wines with as we taste through the, the white and the red as well. But like, especially with my job, you know, talking to sommeliers and wine professionals and trying to convince restaurants to, you know, bring these wines onto their list. Like most places don't have lamajun, which is, you know, uh, like grilled lamb over lavash, which is like a, like a flatbread. You know, most places don't do stuffed grape leaves or, you know, um, you know, I don't know, pomegranate infused, you know, rice pilaf or things like that, right? This isn't the sort of food that I think most restaurants choose to have on their list, but like what's great about all of these wines is that they have that minerality, they have that acidity that is so important with food friendly wines. And so what I try and do is I always look for kind of alternative pairings beyond just the quote unquote ethnic food. And you had mentioned like 
that Armenian food might not have a lot in common with like Ottoman food. But in reality, I think like a lot of these countries, like they were all very close to one another. Like we have baklava, you know, or baklava, you know, depending on where you are in this part of the world. All these places loved filo dough. They loved lamb. They loved feta. They loved, you know, cooking rice pilaf, things like this. I mean, all these countries do have like a through line. And I know Zach's on the call and he might not want to unmute himself, but he's been to Armenia so, so many times. And I think could probably speak to what the food's like over there right now, because it's probably very different than the food like my my grandparents knew when they came from Armenia as children. So, um, but maybe now's a good time for us to jump into the white one. Uh, hey, Chris, this is Zach. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, see you all. And it's really exciting to see everyone uh, in the Chicago area enjoying the wine. Um, so uh, it's, it's actually an interesting story uh, to add to, to what Chris just said. There, the food in Armenia is great, and particularly in the capital of Yerevan, it's, it's, it's much improved. Uh, I used to go there a lot as a kid, and there was not very, the options weren't great, and much of that was because kind of, there was still the Soviet influence, and so there wasn't really a great food scene. Um, and really over the last five or so years, it's, it's rapidly changed. And a lot of it actually has to do with um, the exodus of Armenians from Syria, because there's a, there's a big population of Armenians in Syria. And obviously with all the, the, the issues that have happened in that country politically and otherwise, there have been a lot of, of, of Syrian Armenians who have um, emigrated to Armenia. And a lot of them are actually really great restaurant tours and cooks. And so they've all opened really amazing restaurants in Yerevan. And that has jump-started the, the food scene there. So um, kind of a bit of a perverse reason why, but, but the, uh, the country has benefited from that. Amazing. That's, that's exactly the sort of like, we talk about terroir so often just being like the soil type or the sunshine or the amount of rainfall or the elevation, but terroir also has a human side of it. And it's, you know, that expression, if it grows together, it goes together. And I think that's especially true with wines from this part of the world. You know, you think about some of the best, you know, seafood wine out there and it's like Chocolina or Albarino or, you know, Muscadet, you know, places that are all close to the water. and. For me, at least, these wines have a sense of place beyond just the geology or climate or anything like that. So I know some of you didn't have the sparkling wine. Some of you had the white wine. So real quick, that is 100% uh, Voskeat. It's just that one variety. Uh, the name of the winery, Zulal, Z-U-L-A-L, is the Armenian word for pure because the winemaker, uh, Amy Kushkarian, founded the winery. And her goal when she founded the winery was she wanted to create wines that weren't interrupted by kind of like winemaking technique, like a lot of new oak. And she wanted you to be able to taste the variety itself. So for those of you that have tasted the wine so far, I'm gonna call on Catherine again, because you had said that you only brought two of the wines and this was one of them. So I tried getting you to chat all about the wines earlier. I'm gonna get you to chat about it now. <laughs> okay, can I defer to my husband? He has a much more discerning palate. Mm -hmm. You said something yeah, off, yeah. Yeah, off um, mic that I thought was interesting, which was like it was. Uh, Sean's comment or, or um, the, what she was saying earlier, it actually uh, made me think, you know, we, we are also, I would say, generally speaking, more red drinkers. And we've heard a few different white varieties in the past, mostly Viognier be referred to as a red drinker's white. And I feel like this definitely falls into that category of like a, a bolder, more flavorful white wine. Um, you know, it, it definitely has, uh, a, a, you know, some body there and uh, just like a, a lot of nuance. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Shelly, I know you just entered the chat. You said you were having this with pizza. What kind of pizza is it? What are the toppings on this pizza? It's just, um, it's just spinach. Okay, I love that. Yeah. Spinach on pizza, I love, I love having greens on pizza. It's funny you say that because I actually had this wine um, last Thursday, I think it was. I think it was Thursday, maybe it was Friday, but I was in Boston and I went out to a restaurant that had this particular wine, the Voskeat, 
by the glass and I ordered a glass to go with my meal and it was a pizza restaurant. And the appetizer was a crudo. Um, it was some raw fish with like a tomato kind of like broth, but it was clarified tomato. So it wasn't red in color. It was like really, really tart. And the wine you had described, um, the wine earlier as like a Viognier or a red drinkers wine where it's like really full bodied. Um, mm -hmm. Catherine, I can't remember your uh, better half's name over there, but- um, Jonah, I, I'm gonna, Jonah, rena Jonah, I'm gonna Jonah. rename <laughs> us. This is my work computer. So that's why it's all, you know, <laughs> Catherine official, but I'm gonna add his name in yeah. here. But but the 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 wine was too kind of like ripe and round to go with the crudo. But the pizza that we had to Shelly's kind of like spinach pizza that she has going over there. This one had like a lot of greens on it. I think it had sugar snap peas that they had added after the pizza finished cooking to add like some texture. And that with the Vosque out was just so, so good. So roasted vegetables to me is a perfect pairing for this. Delicious. Okay. Anyone else out there? Melody, do you have this wine on you? Do you have the Vosque out on you? I do, I do, I do. And I was I was agreeing with Shelly with, and I'm, now I'm thinking about, I, should, I could order a pizza with artichokes Ooh. because it feels like it would pair very well with artichokes. Okay. Yes. And I think we're like an artichoke. That's delicious. Right now, so all the better. Always an artichoke season for Melody. <laughs> Love to see it. Um, so this wine doesn't see any oak whatsoever. I don't think we talked about that, but again, going back to that idea of making wines that speak to the variety and speak to the place, um, Amy Kushgeri and the founder of the winery didn't want to use new oak on any of these bottlings. So even the reserve, the red wine we're going to have, it sees oak, but it's neutral oak. There's no new oak on it, which I think is a really good segue maybe into the red wine itself. So Rowan, that this is absolutely gorgeous. And I, I mean, I've had mine open for about, I, I use my Corbin 10 minutes, so it's not chilled anymore. Um, but for me, it's like, it's just showing so beautifully. And I love the salinity at the end. It's just so pretty. So Such that's a really fun I kind of like herbal finish to it. Yeah, yes. that salinity too, very salty. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the difference of oak? Cause you were taught, I've never, like I've no like oak versus no oak, but I haven't heard like red oak versus different types of oak. That was an interesting thing to me. Yeah, totally. So, um, so what I was trying to say with that comment was that the red wine sees neutral oak. Um, so the oak that's used for a uh, Chardonnay and the oak that's used for a Cabernet or a Pinot Noir, typically the big kind of like determining factor is whether the oak is French oak or whether it's American oak. And it's two genetically different types of trees. So American oak is like what's common in Zinfandel in California or Syrah from Australia where it's called Shiraz or in Rioja in Spain. And that has a very different flavor than French oak. And the oak that's used for these Armenian wines and in the case of the red, is Caucasian oak, which genetically is the same material as French oak. It's just grown in a slightly different place. So, um, so that's that's a really cool thing. Is that the oak grows much more slowly in Armenia, so it has a tighter grain, and that tighter wood grain means that you get more kind of like texture from the oak barrel. So, so really fun stuff. Um, and the neutral fact is that barrels impart a lot of like aromas, like vanilla, nutmeg, clove, and cinnamon all those baking spices that we love in some of our Napa Chardonnays or in our, you know, sometimes it comes across as almost like a mocha or like coffee aroma in red wine, the way that the oak aromas and kind of like compounds interact with red wine, but that gives it more of like a chocolatey kind of flavor. Um, and those kind of like lactones and different aromas and chemicals, they fade as the barrel gets older and older, which is why a lot of wineries will only use a barrel one time. You know, but in the case of this winery, they're using neutral barrels. They have uh, some other wineries in Armenia that use 100% new oak. So they're able to get used barrels from them. So super fun stuff. Um, so has anyone had a chance to try the red wine yet? No? Yes. It's all right. Regine's on top of it. We're going to open it yeah. now. So. Yeah, I had everything. Oh, okay, cool. So I had awesome. my whole spiel. So I'll tell Love you, it. for me, when well, I open it, 
I guess, regime. Well, go ahead and open. You, okay, you're gonna open it. Okay, enjoy. Is that what you said? I don't know. What you, I don't know what you said, Pam. Yeah, we'll go ahead and open it. Okay. Let me know. I'm like, why is she asking me if she should open? It? Are you inviting me over to help you drink it? Is that what it is? <laughs> um, for me, I'm getting these um, like a lot of red fruit, but there's a tart cranberry at the center of it. Um, there's I don't want to call it smokiness, but there is this like tar smoky quality to it. Um, oh, there's less K. Um, I just, I, I think this is, and I, I love, um, texture is very important to me. You guys know this in wine. And I, I just really love the texture and how it glides on the tongue. So. Beautiful. Yeah, to me, like you get that really bright red fruit that you were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. There's that beautiful acidity. Um, and then you get that kind of like savory, smoky character, I think from the oak, which is so, so, so fun. So, and Regine, I know you're not eating right now, but if you were eating, like all those things that you're describing as you're tasting it, like what do you think that pairs with? So for me, something that I cook at home a lot is um, I'm, I love making roasted chicken and I use a lot of fresh herbs, like herb de Provence. I think that would be awesome. Um, last week, I stopped by Pam's house and she made a salmon and she like she seared it so it had this really great crust and it was so flavorful I think that would be really delicious um and I love my I love pepperoni pizza like that is my guilty pleasure so a pepperoni pizza would also I think be really good with this I love the number of times pizzas come up in conversation um, <laughs> over the course of this. And it's funny because that dish that I was describing earlier, Lemajun, mm -hmm. um, the other name for that is Armenian pizza. That's mm -hmm. what they call it. So whether you have, you know, American Italian pizza or Chicago style deep dish or Armenian Lemajun, you know, um, I know Zach's still on the call. He probably has a different way of spelling Lemajun than I do. But in our family, we spelled it this way. And Zach is free to jump in and say how his family would cook it or how they would spell it or all that good stuff. And I'm sure there's a place in Chicago that has it. I'm sure I went to a, a Greek restaurant yesterday and I didn't eat this, but the couple next to me had like a shepherd's pie. And I was so freaking jealous of that uh, shepherd's pie. That would be delicious um, with with this uh, irony. Irony? Am I pronouncing it correctly? Um, irony. Um, irony. Okay. Yeah. You want to you want to check us because we want to be able to to pronounce everything properly, right, guys? Yes. Yes, we do. Okay. Irony. All right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Need the correct pronunciations. Yes. Yeah. So I had put the um, I had put the phonetics in for Voskeat earlier. And maybe Zach, if you're still there, you can type in the uh, phonetics, but it's, I'm pretty sure, R, Ren, E. R and e. I, I'm bad with spelling all that stuff, but like. We did a fun Instagram post on that a little while ago. Oh, we did we? How to pronounce it. So I'll link Catherine that. Catherine always keeping up on the uh, IG. She's our social media guru. So within the company. I, mean, I pronounce things right. Yeah. But I could just share how to do that. <laughs> You're also like the one person in the company that's not Armenian too. So like, it's good for us to have that gut check of like, you know, I think Armenians all have this shared like history and experience. So sometimes it's good, I think, to have someone on the team who can be like, that's, you, you guys are kind of like talking Armenian stuff right now. So I remember when Zach interviewed me, he, he started talking in Armenian. And I was like, my parents didn't teach me. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Down in Texas, we say howdy. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that was fun. Um, so I know we couldn't get the, unless there are any questions about um, r &E, um, we couldn't get the rosé, but I'd love for you to spend a little time. Um, Regine, I, I just, I just yes. put a question in the chat. I just put a question in the chat. Oh. Is this considered, first of all, Omar loves it. I also, I'm also in, I also love it, but I don't really know why I love it. I just think it's tasty. Maybe it's because I'm eating pizza and I'm happy. Um, but is this considered a medium body? What do you think? Don't answer, Chris. 
Okay. See, this is why you as a teacher are so hard. Because, like, <laughs> I think it is. I think it is, but, like, I don't know. I think you're right. I think you do know. Yes, you're always right. Don't second guess yourself. You got this. You got this. <sighs> Shelly's an A-plus student. <laughs> so um, you're an A-plus student as well, or is he just riding on the coattails? Riding on the coattails. Actually, Omar is- Shelly's, uh, Shelly's husband. I know she's always right. <laughs> hey, my guy, he knows what's up. Uh, Jonah, Jonah thinks it's light bodied. So I don't know. Yeah. And debate going on in the Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> I think what's so fun about the wine is there is the acidity and freshness we associate with, you know, light bodied wines, but because of the concentration, there is like a little bit of depth to it. I think definitely compared to like a Napa Valley, like 15, 16% alcohol red wine, this does come across very light bodied. Um, it's always fun to put these wines like almost in a lineup because we rarely taste Armenian wine next to other Armenian wine. It'd be Armenian wine next to California wine. But if you put it in the lineup with other things from other parts of this world, like this part of the world, I think you'd find that structurally it's right in that like medium bodied range but globally yeah it's definitely on the lighter side so if you okay so on that note and maybe this is improper but if you did put it next to an oregon or a california wine what would it be next to like what would be its what would be its peer or translator translator yeah, absolutely translator is a great way to describe it because that's really what we have to do sometimes it's like and especially as like sommeliers, your job is to like, oh, well, if you like this, you might like this, you know? And for me, this wine would be close to like an Oregon Pinot Noir, maybe, you know? Yeah, I know you'd said, you know, that part of, you know, the Pacific Northwest. And for me, there's structurally a lot of similarities with Pinot. It also kind of reminds me of Austrian varieties. Um, I don't know if anyone out there has had like a Blau Frankish before. Yes. Or something. So tasty, so good. Okay. Um, Syrah is another grape I think it has some things in common with, or Barbera is another one. So fun things out there, all tasty. But Oregon Pinot Noir is something that I think Zach has, you know, said to him, it reminds him of that for sure. So. So Chris, I only have the Vascayat and I, but I like Shelly's question. So what would you compare that to, or what would you, how would you translate that? Yeah, so like texturally, we were describing all these really interesting things going on in the wine and with that concentration. And I don't know if like when you were tasting it, you felt this kind of like, it's almost like when you bite into like an almond or you eat like marzipan, it's like this like, it's not like nutty in an oxidative way. Like it's nutty in kind of like a, just like textural way, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, not that white wine will have like tannins per se, but it's got that like grippy, like slight like feeling of bitterness on the palate. Um, and to me, that is always very similar to what you find in like Pinot Gris, um, especially mm -hmm. Pinot Gris from Oregon or Pinot Grigio when it's grown in Italy. There's another variety they grow in the same region where they grow Pinot Grigio and it's called Tokai Friolano. Uh, this has a lot of similarities to that. I think Chenin Blanc, yes. if you have one that's not sweet, but a dry <laughs> Chenin, yeah. that's something yes. I talk about a lot. Regine, in your experience with this wine, does it remind you of anything? I, I like ditto everything you said, the viscosity of a Pinot Blanc. Um, there is the dustiness of a Chenin Blanc, which we had in our class last month. Um, and where was my invite to that class? That's like my favorite variety. Oh, yeah. you know, okay. We're, we're gonna actually ask you to, to uh, teach a special class one day. That would be awesome. <laughs> on Chenin Blanc or on, on what, whatever? Well, whatever. I mean, I just, everything you present. I love Chenin. Awesome. Chenin is like my, my sweet spot. That was like one of my aha moments in wine. So yeah, I, yeah. I love, love Chenin Blanc so much. So I love yeah. Chenin Blanc as well. So oh, maybe well, that's why I'm enjoying Chenin the Blanc I've on this side. I love it. Yeah. So, Sherry, where do you like your Chenin Blancs from? Uh, South Africa. Oh yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I love Baden Horse. They're a great producer. That's um, what we had last week or last month. Mm -hmm. There we go. Fun. Yeah, sure did. Love. Affordable, delicious, big fan. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the, the rosé. 
I know. I'm so sorry we got sidetracked. No, no, it's okay. I, we're good on time. We always go a little over, but I want to be respectful of your time. So this is actually pronounced chauffeur. Um, and this is the rosé. It will be out in a few weeks. Um, if you guys caught me on WGN today, I talked about how much I love this. And I really do. It's delicious. I corvined it. And um, it's awesome. So Chris, why don't you tell us about it? Yeah, absolutely. So this is actually a partnership that we created with the father-daughter winemaking team behind the two wineries that you tried earlier, Kush and Zulal. So it's a father-daughter winemaking team. Vahe is the father, the one I was talking about earlier, and his daughter Amy started Zulal. And you know, the, the challenge we always have with wines from this part of the world is that people get scared off when they, you know, see the packaging and there are all these words they don't know how to pronounce. And the best part about wine, we were talking about it earlier, is exploring a new region, you know, trying something different, you know, going on a bit of an adventure. And that's why we created this particular label in collaboration with Vahe and Amy. The goal was, how can we introduce people in the United States to Armenian wine without scaring them off? Like, how can we make it as approachable as possible? And create that sense of exploration, which is how we created chauffeur. It's the Armenian word for a chauffeur. And you got to remember how challenging it was when the Soviet Union pulls out of Armenia. It's autonomous for the first time in 70 years. And a certain level of hustle was needed to make it. You know, Armenia wasn't sitting on a well of oil underneath it. You know, their, their biggest exports are like potatoes and copper. It's not like a huge booming industry. So there's a lot of hustle required. And if you go to the capital city of Yerevan, you'll see these guys and they're like a New York taxi driver, like times 10 when it comes to like that hustle ability, you know, in terms of just like, these are the guys that'll go out and like change a tire. These are the guys where you're saying like our, you know, travel company was supposed to book us on a tour and we weren't able to go with them. The show fairs in town will be like, no problem. I'll drive you halfway across the country to take you to this monastery. They know the answers to everything. They're just like, they are your tour guide. And that's what this wine is supposed to be. It's your tour of Armenia. So this rosé is just like really fresh and bright. It's coming from the similar or similar vineyards that are used for the Zulal wines. So what they do is they use the red grapes that previously would go into the red wines that y'all were drinking. And they use a little bit of that to make a rosé for us uh, because the American you know, wine drinker loves rosé. And uh, we think people should try rosé from other places beyond just like Provence or California. There are other places making cool rosé and especially using these super cool ancient varieties grown at such high elevation. It makes for great rosé and it makes for a lot of fun. So that's kind of the story behind Chauffeur. It is so good. Um... It, for me, it, it tastes like, in all of the best possible ways, um, a watermelon Jolly Rancher. I love it. I sweet. love it. It's not sweet, but it's got the juiciness of a watermelon. The acidity is, is just gorgeous. Uh, what I recommended today was um, a grilled, uh, grilled veggie salad, especially mm. sweet red peppers. Like sweet red peppers with this, I think would be just yummy it'd be a nice balance it's really really good so hopefully you guys you guys get to try it um in a few weeks so. watermelon jolly rancher used to be like my go-to description for this particular rosé from oregon from a producer called teutonic oh um, I know Teut oh my god i love their that, like, the best rosé uh, yes yes the mind blowing so good yes 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 and that has like a similar, like very juicy, like unabashedly just like, yo, I'm a fruity rosé. I'm not sweet, but nope. I'm very, very fruit. It's just like so, so good. It's the yeah. best. Yeah, it's, it's really yummy. Uh, any questions or comments? Shelly, Underwood's sparkling rosé sounds delicious right now. It's kind of warm where I am. So like that sounds like a a killer. You know what's weird about their sparkling rosé is that I'm totally addicted to the ones in the can, but the ones in the bottle don't taste the same, and I don't know why. I just, I just don't know why. Like, I don't know if the bubbles are a different size. Like, I mean, I literally don't know why. Like, it's kind of mind-boggling to me, but... Well, I guess as the bottle, like, is open and as you're pouring more and more for yourself, it's losing a lot of its effort. Yes, what right ends up being more flat, I guess, because the Underwood Sparkling Rosé 
I mean, for a while I was hoarding it because it was like flying off the shelves, but now I think they increased their, I think they increased their supply. So it's not as big of a problem. <laughs> the, the first time I had Underwood, I was at a, I think it was ACL, uh, the Austin concert thing, and they were selling them. And I just remember never loving wine as much as I loved wine in that moment. Uh, Cause it was just so hot and like dust is getting kicked up and you're just like dehydrated. You've been waiting hours and hours to see this band. And then you got to run over to another stage and I bought an Underwood and it was great. It was so, so good. It was so refreshing in that moment. It was the best wine ever. That sounds like anybody else that wasn't us would be like, I needed a beer. And you're like, Underwood wine. <laughs> I'm never in the mood for beer. I'm only in the mood for wine. Or oh. Same. It has like chocolate and coffee in it and has like a alcohol by volume of apparently 25 when you add chocolate or coffee to it. I'm like, why is the alcohol by volume so high? But it's like a four loco you add coffee to it. If you do, I don't really like beer anymore, but if I do, I like a chocolate and or a coffee beer. Like so it's not a stout, but it is a dark looking beer. Yeah. But for whatever reason, those beers, their ABV is super high. That's wow. why I love them because you only need a little bit. Like they <laughs> ideally serve them smaller. Yeah, like chop. Um, so Chris, tell me about this cocktail um, that you suggested. Is it is this like a traditional Armenian cocktail or Catherine suggested it? No? Just to the idea of a cocktail. Oh, <laughs> I thought this was like a traditional, like uh, the Armenian well, version of a Kia Royale. That was definitely Chris's intel because pomegranate is very special and traditional to Armenia. So the, you know, combining the two with our Kush was his well, kind of idea, but, but yeah. I'm going to make it because <laughs> this is what you had in mind, but I got this big old jug of pomegranate syrup. I love it. Is this what you had in mind? Yeah, you know, I think grenadine, right, just doesn't do it justice. Because the grenadine you buy in the store these days, right, there's no actual pomegranates that are used to make that grenadine, right? right. It's all just like, you know, not even sugar, but like, I don't know, corn syrup or something like that. But original grenadine was made with pomegranates. And pomegranates are indigenous to Armenia, Iran, this part of the Caucasus. Um, and it's a symbol of fertility. It's a symbol of like health. Oh, whoa, 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 Chris. Uh -uh, I know fertility happening up in here. <laughs> I, I I didn't make up the history. I, you know. She took a soup. Chris, go ahead. <laughs> um, but, you know, pomegranates have always been seen in a lot of like Armenian iconography. Like if you look back over like paintings and sculptures and all sorts of things, it, it's this incredibly important fruit to Armenia and, and this region as a whole. And to that point, for a long time, they were making pomegranate wine, um, which nowadays, if you go to the store and you find pomegranate wine, it's all just like super syrupy sweet. Um, mm -hmm. But there are there were producers, I don't know if anyone is doing it anymore, but they were making true, like fully fermented wine from pomegranate juice. Um, so pomegranate juice plays a big role a Cure Royale is a traditional French cocktail using champagne, using Chambord. We wanted to create a version of that for ourselves. So this is so yummy. So I don't know if you guys saw the recipe. It's one ounce of pomegranate um, liquor or cocktail mix or simple syrup. And then um, half an ounce of fresh lemon juice. And then I topped it off with the Kush origin. This is, it's really refreshing. It's not sweet at all. Right, it's more tart. This it's it's really yummy. Hey, Doug, good to see your face. Howdy, uh, Doug. Hello. So before, and you know, we always have our after party, and we're gonna do that. But before we wrap up, I do want to say uh, one thing, and you can ask more question if Chris has time. So we put a lot of work, Catherine and I, into uh, this particular event. We did a lot of. Um, uh, advertising and we did a lot of pushing because I honestly sincerely believe in these wines. I think they're delicious. I think they're unique. And what I would ask all of you, if you enjoy the wines, is to share them with someone else. So we will post this on our YouTube like we always do. 
uh, and we always have great wines, don't get me wrong. We always have great wines, great producers, but it's rare that you have a wine that you've never had before, right? Or from a region with so much history that I, I can't believe it was two years ago that I was introduced to wines from Armenia, right? That's crazy. So what I would say is just pass it on, pass the video on and share with friends and just spread the love. If you could do that, that would be awesome because Storica is awesome and the wines are amazing. So, okay, any other questions? Did I just drop the mic? No, I, I, yeah, I think you did, you know, but just one thing to add to that, you know, word of mouth is really the way in which new wine regions get discovered. Um, Cause like when I got started in the wine industry, everyone was like, wine from Sicily, they don't make good wine in Sicily. Like, you know, if you go back 10 years, there were a bunch of producers that no one gave a hoot about. They were just making wine, doing their thing, very humble, just doing their thing. And then eventually people in the US discovered, or people in France, people in, you know, major markets were discovering kind of the secrets of the wine world. And all of a sudden wines from Sicily became super popular. You know, if you go back to 10 years ago, rosé wasn't as popular as it is now, you know, there's something you drank in Provence, maybe, but now it's something really special. And it goes to that idea of communicating, getting the word out there, sharing these things with your friends. I mean, at the end of the day, wine's meant to be shared. So as many of you are doing tonight, so. And follow Storica at Storica. Is it Storica or Storica Wines? Storica underscore wines. Awesome. And Chauffeur, the Rosé actually has its own website and Instagram. I shared the website in this chat. Sure. Uh, and it's at Drink Chauffeur. So you could see a lot of the pre-launch teasing that we're sharing there. Okay, and I will end recording. I will say, just Regine, we do have a store locator on our site. So while, of course, you know, we you can purchase our wines on our website, we are really growing and expanding the business through, you know, various states and everything. So Chicago, hopefully, will have a lot more distribution soon. So we'll keep you in the loop. And, and again, the conversations you have may really help move that along, too. So thank you. <laughs> awesome. All right, thank you all for joining us and uh, we'll be back in two weeks with a rum get together. That's what we're calling it, a rum get together. Woohoo! Jonah's excited because Jonah loves rum. <laughs> I'm invited too, right?